Well, thank you everyone for being here. In theory, most of you should have been able to make it, but I can see the promise of the video being available on YouTube is too strong for the majority of you. So to those of you who have taken time out of your busy day uh, to come here and watch this, thanks. The purpose of this tutorial is, well, it's an extra tutorial for CS246. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to learn how to use the Vim text editor. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of Vim, what Vim is and is not. Uh, hopefully this will be at least a little bit enjoyable. So Vim actually stands for something. It's a short form of Vi Improved. And every time you've been calling Vi in the student environment, well, you haven't been calling the program Vi because it's actually just a link to Vim now. But in the olden days, by which I mean pre-98 or so, there was no Vim, there was just Vi. Vi is a program like Vim, but it misses some of the nice stuff. Uh, some of the things just don't work the way they expect you expect them to. Now, Vi itself is actually not just a text editor that sprung out of nowhere. Vi is a visual mode to the text editor X. X is even older than Vi. X, you could only edit things on one line at a time, and so it was very confusing to use. And believe it or not, X is actually an improved version of an even older text editor, which is called Ed. And Ed is the standard text editor. Ed is very hard to use. If you type anything into Ed except for a very, very small set of commands, it's just going to respond question mark. No other help. And Vim isn't even the most recent version of this line of long and prestigious text editors. In fact, before Vim, or after Vim, there's now NeoVim, which is new Vim. And so I guess the point of all this is to say that if you're using NeoVim, you could more accurately describe what you're using as the new improved visual improved Ed. And if at some point you play around with Ed, you'll see that it really does deserve all of those adjectives because it has come a long way. So what is Vim? Well. You've probably been playing with Vim for a couple weeks now, so you have some idea of what it is. But unless you've used a tutorial of some sort, you're probably not using Vim to the most of its ability. Vim is a couple of things, but most of all, it is small, it is fast, it is extensible by Vim script, it is modal, and I'll explain what that means in a second, and it is a text editor. Vim is not an email client, a compiler, an IDE, or a game console. And if you want those things, I recommend you check out Emacs, which is all of them at the same time and also still a text editor. But Vim is Turing complete. You could do all these things in Vim. Vim has packages to do probably everything I've said, maybe not the game console. But my point is you don't want to. The purpose of Vim is to be very small, and very fast. Whenever I type Vim, it should launch instantly. I shouldn't have to wait a second for it like Emacs does. When I use Vim, I'm hopping in and out of files, and I don't need to worry too much about how much RAM my computer has. As the joke used to go, Emacs stands for 80 megabytes and constantly swapping, which doesn't mean anything much anymore because 80 megabytes of RAM is a pitiful amount. But back whenever computers were younger, that, that was kind of a big thing. Now, I mentioned Vim was modal, and what I mean by that is that it has various modes. It has normal mode, insert mode, command mode, and visual mode are the four main modes you'll be jumping around. And each of those modes has keys doing different things. And what that means is that whenever you're first getting used to Vim, it's going to take a very long time. There's a very steep learning curve, because you don't need to learn one set of key bindings, you need to learn four. Well, maybe not fully four, because in insert mode, your keys just type. So hopefully you have that one figured out. Now, if you have been using Vim figured out yourself, the mode you've probably been using the entire time is insert. And all of your Vim sessions have probably looked like, let's open Vim. Let's press the I button. Now we can write a program, and now we can use this magic WQ command, and that's going to get us out. But that's not, Vim how, that's not how Vim is supposed to be used. In Vim, all of the program you write, that's going to happen in insert mode. 
But whenever you need to make changes to your program, move around your program, delete things or move things around, that's going to happen in the so-called normal mode. That's the mode that you enter Vim in. That's the mode I'm in right now if I don't have anything else going on. If I want to do something more interesting, maybe search or maybe search and replace something, well, there's a mode for that as well. That's called command mode. That's the mode you go into whenever you exit your program or whenever you open files, all that sort of stuff. And there are more modes too. If I want to make more complicated selections, then you'll see that there is a visual mode. And visual mode allows me to select blocks of text like that. I can play around with these blocks of text. I can cut them. I can paste them. I can move them all around using normal mode. Now, the main content of this tutorial is we're going to be going through a program called VimTutor. VimTutor is available on the student environment. It basically comes with every installation of Vim. Um, so I see most of you have your laptops here. If you do have your laptop here, I strongly recommend you open it up, connect to the student server, get VimTutor running, and we'll go through it together. There are seven lessons in VimTutor. I like the first six of them, and we're going to do the first six of them. If you feel strongly about completing the seventh lesson, by all means, do it on your own time. Um, but I won't be doing it here. And so to open that, it is just Vim Tutor, all one word. And what Vim Tutor is, it's a gigantic text file of about 1,000 lines. And in going through that text file, there's going to be lots of instructions for us to follow. And we're going to learn some of the basic commands in Vim. Now, we can skip all this exposition because I've more or less given it to you. Lesson 1.1 is moving the cursor. And I'm sure that, again, unless you've read a tutorial somewhere on how to use Vim, most of you are already going to be disturbed by this. Because in most text editors you use, the cursor is moved using the arrow keys. And indeed, the arrow keys, up, down, left, right, they do work in Vim. But you shouldn't be using them. People will tell you. You know, you can do whatever you want. It's your text editor. Um, configure it the way you want and use it the way you want. But I think that's wrong. I do not think you should be using the arrow keys in Vim. And there are multiple reasons for this. First of all, this is just how Vim works. Everything in Vim is designed to work with this extra set of keys that you see here, H, J, K, L. And it's well set up. I mean, it's all on the home row. It's these four keys right next to each other. You can put one hand on there, and you can have uh, all of your movement. They're just on one hand. H moves you left. L moves you right. K moves you up. J moves you down. That way, you never need to have your hands leave the home row whenever you're performing most operations in normal mode. The amount of time it takes for your hands to move from the home row to the arrow keys back to the home row, you could have typed another line of code, depending on your typing speed. The less time you spend on these stupid tasks, such as just moving your hands back and forth, the more time you can be playing video games because you've done all your assignments. Now, another reason that you might not want to move your hands off the home row is strain injuries. And this is a serious point. If you spend 40 years, eight hours a day programming, moving your hands back and forth, you could seriously damage your hands by the end of it. And I'm not claiming that this is some silver bullet that's going to make you never get RSI in your life, but it's certainly going to help if you keep your hands on the home row, don't move your hands as much as they need to move. Uh, yeah, it's all going to be good. So I strongly recommend you do not use the arrow keys. Now, you might say to me, well, Spencer, I want to move around in insert mode. I, I, you know, I'm inserting something here. Say I'll, I'll just jump into insert mode for a second. And now I realize I want to move back a couple. Well, I can't use HJKL because, well, what's it going to do? It's just going to print a bunch of H's, of course. But I can use the arrow keys. That's not a good excuse because you're not supposed to move around in insert mode. If you need to do any sort of movement in Vim, you should be jumping back to normal mode using the appropriate movement commands and then going back into insert mode once you're ready. So let's move on from lesson 1.1, moving the cursor. I do recommend you stay with HJKL. And in fact, one thing you can do if you feel yourself jumping back to the arrow keys by force of habit is that at the end, 
Um, Lesson 7, it has a configuration in it, and you'll be able to modify that configuration file to actually entirely disable the arrow keys, which you can do because they have no purpose in Vim. I hope I'm driving that home hard enough. Lesson 1.2, hopefully something you've figured out so far because you have had to write things in CS246, and I believe most of you have been using Vim as how to exit Vim. So the trick for this is first you need to be in normal mode, and to get into normal mode from anywhere else, just press the escape button. And from normal mode, if you press colon, you'll see I get a little colon here down on the bottom of the screen. And that tells me that I'm in command mode. From command mode, I can enter one of a wide variety of commands. But the one that we're going to be using now is Q. Uh, Q is quit. And if I do this, it's going to tell me I haven't written anything since the last change because I did play around with this file a little bit. I modified it. But I can say Q exclamation mark. That's going to override. And so it's not going to care about the fact that I'm missing some changes. All right. So using the J key to go down, I can go back here. We're done 1.2. Hopefully, we're now confident that we can exit Vim. So here's our first real command. And you'll notice that we're now editing text, but we're not entering insert mode at all. This is all taking place in normal mode. Using HJKL, you can move your cursor over this line that has an arrow on it. And well, we'll see they've spelled cow wrong. There are uh, two C's here. So I move my cursor over one of the C's, and I can press the X button. And what X does is it deletes a single character under the cursor. What a day. Now we can keep our cursor moving on. Now we get to D, X again. We can delete a V, X. We can delete an R using X, an H using X, and one of the O's using X. So that's a lot of X's. X is our first command. X deletes one character under the cursor. Surprisingly useful. And let's move on to lesson 1.4. And this note they have here, they say, as you go through the tutor, do not try to memorize, learn by usage. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, maybe you have some interpretation of it, but I'm not sure. All right. Now 1.4, text editing insertion. We are getting to this command, which is probably the only command that most of you have been using, which is to go into insert mode. And insert mode, as the name implies, it puts you into a place where you can insert text. It switches from normal mode to insert mode. And in insert mode, all of your keys work like they might, you might expect them to. They actually insert text. So here we go. What they want us to do is go to this line with a little arrow, and using insert mode, put some text in. So. Here's what I'll do. I can put my cursor here. I can say I. Now I can just type it. Escape takes me back to normal mode. Now I can use HJKL to keep moving again. I. Escape again. Now I use HJKL to move over again. Like that. So I is sort of your bread and butter command. I is what you do when you want to insert text. There are lots of other commands that are going to bring you into insert mode, and we'll see them as we move on. Um, the difference between all of these commands that put you into insert mode is where they put you into insert mode. So I puts you into insert mode right at where your cursor is. But that's not necessarily where you always want to get into insert mode, because you might want to insert somewhere that's far away from your cursor, um, but somewhere that you can easily describe. And so that's what this next command is. This is appending. And so what a capital A is going to do is it's going to first move your cursor to the end of the line. Then it's going to put you into insert mode. And in particular, what you're inserting is going to be after um, the last character in the line, um, which is great if, say, I'm you know, right here on this relatively long line, and I just need to make a change on the end. So what I can do is I can say capital A. Bang, you can see from the bottom there, I'm now in insert mode and my cursor is at the end of the line. And now I can type this line. Escape brings me back to normal mode. Now I'll do the same thing over here. I'll move back to this part of the line. Capital A for append. That'll bring me to the end of the line and put me in insert mode. And 
Again, we can do that. <coughs> All right, so here's another important one. They, this Vim tutor is filled with these warnings to read a lesson completely and, uh, and then do the things in that lesson. That's not really necessary because I'm here. I can tell you what you need to do. We're going to quit this tutor. And we're going to make a file. And the way you make a file in Vim is you can either start Vim with no file name. That's fine. But most of the time, you probably know the name of the file you want to use. So you can just put the file name here, Vim test. What am I going to do in test? Well, I'll press I to go into insert mode. You can see on the bottom of the screen, I'm now in insert mode. I'll type some test, uh, some random text. Escape, I'm back in normal mode. Now I want to save this. The command in Vi to save or Vim to save is colon W. You can see on the bottom of the screen from normal mode I pressed colon. That brings me to command mode. In command mode I press W and that will write the file. And if I do that, I get this nice little line on the bottom telling me that the file was indeed written as I expected. Then I can quit. But if I want to make some more changes first, say this. I can say WQ, that's write and quit, and then I'll do both at the same time. So it's useful to save time. All right, we'll jump back into Vim Tutor. And that's all they wanted us to do in this 1.6. I won't make you read that big gigantic wall of text. So they have a brief summary here um, of what we've done in this first lesson. You can take a look at this if you forget. But what we've learned is HJKL to move. Please use that instead of arrow keys. We've learned how to launch Vim on files that we want. We've learned how to quit. We've learned how to write and quit. And we've learned two different ways to enter insert mode. The first entering at our current cursor position with lowercase i, and the second entering at the end of the line with uppercase a. And finally, they have this important note here that if you're ever scared, if you've ever hit a key that you didn't mean to hit, uh, then what you can do is you can just say escape. It'll cancel everything. It'll take you back to normal mode. Um, as you'll see, there are command repetitions. And so this is a very useful thing to have, lest you do something unfortunate. Uh, one example I can give from my, my own work or my own experience in industry is once I had to enter a phone number in Vim. And so I entered the phone number, and then nothing typed. So I realized, oh, I was in normal mode, not insert mode. So I entered insert mode, and I typed the phone number, and I hit escape. And then my computer crashed. Uh, because if you type a number before you do something in Vim, what you're going to see is that it repeats it the number of times you typed the number. So that works for inserts, too. And so what Vim thought to do was to insert that phone number I had typed something on the order of 10 to the 10 times, which was not what I wanted it to do. And had I realized that sooner, I could have just hit escape uh, instead of being forced to do 1,000 or 100,000 or however many numbers I'd already typed times that command. All right. Now, that was just basic text editing stuff. That's stuff every single text editor can do. Um, well, maybe you don't need this whole modal thing to do it, but certainly every text editor can type at the current position of the cursor. And certainly every text editor can move to the end of the line. That's what the home and end buttons are for, for the beginning and end of line. But here's where we're going to start to see the power of Vim. Vim commands can largely be split into three categories. There are these commands that just sort of do something there are these operations. They also do something, but they're special because they can interact with the third kind of command, which is a motion. And so a motion, um, well, it does exactly what it sounds like. It moves the cursor. And so the motion that we're going to be working with here is W. So if I press W, you can see what's happening. I'm moving to the start of each word. So that's a handy little trick. W can move you around faster. And D stands for delete. So if I were to press D, W, that deletes a word. And every command in Vim can sort of be expanded to this roughly grammatical English sentence. Um, 
And all you need to do is remember what does the first letter of this word actually represent as an action. So in this case, D becomes delete, W becomes word, and so the command DW means delete word. And so if I go down to this sentence here, they want us to play around with. We want to delete all the words that don't fit. There are delete some words, delete that don't belong, oops, delete in this sentence, like so. And so again, we've managed to fix the sentence without ever having to go to insert mode, which is important. Um, and I guess this is another one of the strange things, is that in Vim, you never have to use the backspace key. Um, really, all of your deleting should be done from normal mode. And so I, w I might even go so far as to say that the backspace key is not proper Vim. Uh, I haven't yet trained myself to not use the backspace key, but maybe someday. So another deletion command we have here is d dollar sign, and that's going to delete us, delete to the end of the line. And the reason that works is again because dollar sign is what's called one of these motions. Dollar sign is the motion that takes you to the end of the line. And so every time you see a dollar sign, you should sort of think end of line. And so what d dollar sign says is delete to end of line. And indeed, if I go here and I say d dollar sign, we're going to end up deleting until the end of the line. So that's pretty useful. We can skip 2.3. 2.3 is explaining what I've been telling you, how Vim has operators and Vim has motions. And the general formula is you take an operator, you take a motion, you stick them together, and you're going to get this cool compound command that does the operator on the range of text specified by the motion. And so far, we've only seen one operator, which is D for delete, but we'll see a couple more later. Similarly, we've seen two motions, and they're adding in a third one here, and we'll see a lot more later. So this first motion they've given is W, which takes you to the beginning of the next word. There's this motion E, which takes you to the end of the current word. And finally, there's this motion dollar sign, which takes you to the end of the line. All right, so 2.4 is combining counts with motions. And this is sort of getting to what I said earlier with multipliers on things. So if I wanted to delete two words, well, I could certainly just say DW, DW, um, but that's not very efficient. And instead, I have these motions so I can multiply. I can say 2W. That's going to move me two words. You see my cursors jumped from this to just. So this is what happens when I enter 2w. And similarly, if I enter 3w, I jump three words. And if I want, I can hit e. e takes me to the end of the line, or the end of the word, sorry. 2e takes me to the end of two words. Two words down, it takes me to the end of that word. And then finally, they're inserting this new motion here that you can play around with zero. It takes you to the start of the line. So for example, if I were here and I said D0, that would delete until the start of the line. If I were here and I said DE, that would delete until the end of the word. And so here they have this exercise that you can play around with to practice deleting multiple words. And they have this line of text marked with an arrow. Uh, it has a bunch of words in it that you can delete. And so, for example, here I've put my cursor over the first word I want to delete, and I want to get rid of two words here, so I'll say D, 2, W. And that works exactly like we expect it does, because it expands to this English sentence, delete two words. And I can go forward again. I can say D, 4, W. That deletes four words. And I can go forward a bit more, and I can say D, 3, W, because that's going to delete three words. All right, so one other thing that these operators usually do is that if you don't want to specify a motion, rather, if you want your motion to apply to the whole line, well, there's two things you could do. First, you could go to the start of the line with zero, and then you could type operator dollar sign. 
because that would do it to the whole line. That's fine. But the thing is, that's three keystrokes. In Vim, three keystrokes is too many keystrokes. And so they put a way that you could do it with two. And the way you can do it with two is to just repeat the name of the operator. So for example, for D, that's delete. To delete a full line, just say D twice, D, D. Later, we're going to see an operator C. And again, C, C will apply C to the whole line. And then even later, we're going to see this operator Y. And Y, Y will apply Y to the whole line. So what they want us to do here is to delete these lines to make the poem make sense. Roses are red, mud is fun. Not sure about that. So we'll delete that. And here we can use 2DD. That's going to be, oh. See, I've accidentally hit 2 twice. So if I hit DD, that would delete 22 lines, which is not what I want. So instead, I could have just hit Escape, and that would have gotten rid of that. I'll say 2DD, and that'll get rid of two lines. And now our poem reads like it's supposed to, I assume. I see I was getting ahead of us here because the next thing that they want us to do is this undo command. Vim has a very powerful undo feature. Um, every command you ever type into Vim is stored in this undo buffer, including text you insert. And so as you find yourself using Vim, you might realize, oh, I wish I hadn't done that thing. Well, just like any modern text editor, you can undo stuff just with this U button. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix all the errors on this line. And you can recall earlier we learned this lowercase x command that's going to delete a single character under the cursor, so use that. You can say lowercase x. Now I'm going to say www.xwlx, www.lx, and so on and so forth. And now we've fixed all the errors on that line. Now, if I start pressing lowercase u, yep? Uh, real quick, you can use w to go to the next word. Is there a way to go back a word? Right, so the question was, is there a way to go back a word? I'm repeating it for the video so the microphone catches it. I'm not crazy. Um, the question was, is there a way to go backward? And the answer is yes, uh, you can use the b. b will go back to the start of the last word. Good question. All right, so I'm going to use lowercase u. That's going to undo all of those errors. Great. There's also a redo command. And the redo command is control R. So I'm going to redo my fixes. Finally, there's one more form of this undo command, which is uppercase U. And what uppercase U does is kind of interesting. It, it undoes all the changes that have happened to a particular line. So if you just want a line to return to how it was previously, you can say uppercase U. And that'll undo all of those changes. In this case, since they were all on this line, it's going to replace every single error on this line. And that brings us to the end of lesson two. Lesson two is sort of the meat of what makes Vim interesting. It's this strong composability of all of the sort of things that make up a Vim command. We have these motions, we have these operators, and we can combine them however we want them to however many times we want them to using these numeric multipliers. And the result is that we can express a lot of very strong text editing um, commands in very, very few characters with this. All right, so this one is neat. Put, put we're going to be uh, learning effectively how to cut and paste, which is good. That's something you'd like to be able to do. And as some of you may have already found out by playing around with assignment 0 and assignment 1, Vim doesn't like copy-paste. There are ways to get Vim to accept your pasting a little bit better. But in general, Vim doesn't interact at all with your clipboard. Vim has its own clipboard. And the way you get stuff into that is by deleting it. And we'll see a little bit later, you don't have to delete text to get it into that clipboard. Um, you can get it there without deleting it. but for now, what we can do is we can say, OK, DD, that deletes a line. Now let's move up here. And if we press lowercase p, that's going to put the line we deleted. Great. Now, 
We can also do this. We can delete this line. And if I use an uppercase P instead of a lowercase P, it's going to put it after, or above rather. So let me show that again. If I were here and I press lowercase P, it puts it below the cursor. If I'm below it and I press uppercase P, it puts it above the cursor. And this is just sort of a general pattern that you'll see, is that if I have a command that does something below the cursor when I press it lowercase, then whenever I press it uppercase, it's going to put it above the cursor. It's useful to keep in mind. You can save yourself, again, a single keystroke of moving your cursor one up or one down. But you know, if you save yourself that single keystroke once a day for 40 years, well, I don't know, someone else do the math. Maybe it's worthwhile. At some points, I have to wonder if I've spent more time thinking of the fastest way to do things in Vim than I will save by doing things faster that way. And the answer is probably yes. I'm probably at a net negative. But oh well. So another useful one letter command is replace. And so remember we had x. x just deletes a character. And so if I wanted to change a character, I could say x, I could say i, I could say n, and then escape. That is four characters. We can do better. We can do it in just two characters because there's this r command that replaces something. So if I press r, y, that replaces the character under my cursor with whatever I typed after it, in this case y. So r, p, that's going to replace the character under the cursor with a p. And I go here, r, e will replace the character under a cursor with an e, and then finally r, n replaces the character under a cursor with n. Again, we're being reminded that we should learn by doing, not by memorization, whatever that means. All right. Now things are getting interesting. And now we're getting into our second operator. And this is one of the ones I mentioned earlier, the C operator. So C is very, very, very similar to D. <laughs> There's not much difference between them. The thing is, say I had a word and I wanted to change it. I wanted to change what word this was. Well, OK. This says lub, but it should say line. There are two ways I could go about this. I could delete until the end of the word, de. I could enter insert mode, and I could type line. So that command was three steps. It was dei was the command. In Vim, there's a way to do that in two steps. And what it is, it's this change command. I can say CE. Change does exactly the same thing as delete, but after it finishes the deletion, it puts you into insert mode. Because change means delete, but then I also want to add stuff after to replace what was in there, hence the name change. So I say CE, then line. Great. I can use Word to go through. Now here I get to something that's not right again. So I can say CE to change to the end of the word. This whole word needs changing, so I'll go to the start of it and I can say CE. And then here I can say CE ing. And then I can add the. And so we've probably saved ourselves something like five or six keystrokes changing that line using the change operator instead of the delete operator. Um, yeah, change is, is pretty useful. You'll, this is one of the ones that I find myself using all the time. Because frequently, like for example, if I'm writing a C++ program and something's an int and I decided, well, really it ought to be a long or a long long. I can just go to the front of int. I can type CE, then type in long long and be on my way. Right, and again, this is just another exercise on this whole motions and composability idea, is that since C is an operator, we can combine it with any motion. That last exercise, I was just using it with, uh, with this end of word command E, um, but really it can be done with anything. So they want us to be correcting this line here. And it needs to be changed after this letter S. So I'm going to go here, and now I can say C dollar sign 
So that's going to change to the end of the line. It deletes until the end of the line, and it puts me in insert mode. And now I can type in here. Well, they have some extra spaces. I'm not going to go back for those. Note you can use the backspace key to correct mistakes while typing. There you go. Maybe backspace is idiomatic Vim. You heard it here first from Vim Tutor. All right, so lesson three, just a quick review of what we've seen. We've learned a couple new commands. We've learned that p, the put command, can be used to place deleted text. And this is Vim's equivalent of copy and paste, or cut and paste, rather. We'll see the copy portion later. You can use lowercase r to replace a single character under the cursor. And finally, we have this change operator. It can be combined with any of the motions we've seen already. And uh, it works like the delete operator with just an insert placed after it. All right, so this, yeah, this lesson is a pretty practical one. This, we're not going to be learning any new Vim commands, but rather we're going to be learning a couple of tricks. Um, rather, no new commands to help us edit, tricks, uh, edit text, but rather commands that will help us move around a file. So the first command is Control-G. And if I do Control-G, you're going to see this line pop up on the bottom of my screen. This has a ton of information. It tells me, what file am I in? Has the file been changed or not? What line of the file am I on and how many lines are there? What percentage through the file am I? And what uh, text column am I in currently? So now I'm going to memorize this for a second. 505. I'm on line 505. So now I can press this command, capital G. Oops, hit the wrong button. Capital G. This moves me to the end of the file. You can see there's just some text there thanking people and whatnot. GG, on the other hand, moves us to the start of the file. Those are two are good to remember. And now, finally, we have this uh, ability to modify this capital G command to take us to any line we want to. And so I was on line 505. And so if I type 505G, it will not bring me to the bottom of the file 505 times in a row. Because while consistent, that would be rather silly behavior. Instead, what it will do is it'll bring me to the 505th line. So I did 505G to get here. And if I verify it with Control-G, it's going to tell me that, yes, indeed, I am on line 505. So this is the easiest way to jump around a very large file if you have some idea of what text occurs on what line, what line you want to be on. If you have no idea what line you want to be on, then you probably want to search for text. And there is no Control F in Vim. Instead, there is the slash key. And well, if you open up Firefox and maybe Chrome, I'm not sure, and you type slash, you can use slash for search in your browser as well. Um, so there you go, people taking inspiration from Vim. So here's how it works. If I type slash, Notice my cursor's jumped to the bottom of my screen, and I have a slash there. This is the same place it was at back whenever I was doing colon commands. Now, it wants me to search for this string of text, error, which is spelled incorrectly, so that it only shows up in this lesson, which is good, like that. So I'll type in error, and now I'll hit enter. That's going to search for the first occurrence. And it does indeed bring my cursor to the start of this first messed up word. Now, if I want the next one, I can press lowercase n. That brings me to the next occurrence. And you can see my cursor has jumped down to the next error. If I do it again, I'll get to this last one. And this is the last one in the file. So now if I hit n again, it's going to wrap around back to the top. Now, what if I wanted to search backwards? There are two ways to do it. I can say uppercase n. This is going to search the file backwards. It'll jump to the most recent occurrence above the cursor of this piece of text. The other thing I can do is I can say question mark error like that. And that is the exact same thing as slash, except it moves backwards. And now there's this 
interesting little behavior, which is that now since I'm searching backwards, when I use lowercase n, it takes me to the last occurrence of it. And now when I use uppercase n, it reverses it and it takes me to the next occurrence. So using question mark like this does reverse things a little bit. Um, but if you just play around with it a bit, uh, it's pretty natural. Ah, so this one is very nice. This is super useful. And this is another one where these, these operators sort of become very handy. And this is a matching parenthesis search. The motion is the percent sign for some reason. And what this percent sign does is, I'll show you here first. If I highlight a parenthesis or a bracket or a brace and I press percent, it brings me to the matching one. Oops, that was a dollar sign. That's why I went to the end. Again, per percent. It's going to bring me to the other one of these. And this works well with nesting. So if I do this, notice it takes me to the last parenthesis on this line. Because this one here, the one right beside it, that matches this guy. And I can keep using percent to jump back and forth. And I can use it here as well to jump between these two, and here as well to jump between these two. Now, in the event I'm not on a percent, it has this strange behavior. It's bringing me to the last one in the line. And the reason it does that, I could do it here as well, it brings me to this one. The reason it does that is because when you issue the percent command, what it actually does is it finds the nearest bracket ahead of you, and then it jumps to its matching parenthesis. So if you're already on a brace of some form, then it'll just jump to the matching one, and otherwise, it'll jump to the one matching the next upcoming one. So this is super nifty, uh, especially whenever you're programming, because you're going to have braces everywhere, of course, brackets and braces and parentheses. And they mention here, yes, it's useful for finding unmatched parentheses. If things aren't working the way you want them to or you're having compile errors, you can jump around and see if things aren't matching the way you expect them to. But what you'll also find is that Vim has syntax highlighting, and the syntax highlighting should do a good job of highlighting the other one without you needing to jump there as well. But now you can use um, this guy together with a bunch of these operators we've seen. So for example, if you want to change the text within some parentheses, this should hopefully work. I can say C I, oops, C percent. Well, it's deleted the parentheses, but what it does do for you is it only gets the stuff that should be within those parentheses. So if I say C percent here, there, we've only gotten rid of the things within that set of parentheses. And this is going to figure out the nesting for us. If we de decide we need to delete this whole big statement, like if we have, God forbid, some massable, massive, horrible set of nested function calls within nested function calls in C++ as arguments to each other, and one of them isn't working, we could just delete it with this, uh, with this D percent, and it'll get rid of it for us without us needing to worry too much about what matches with what. All right. Now here's another useful one. This is our first real command in command mode that doesn't just quit the program or write or something. And what it is is substitution. And the way you use it, you go into normal mode, you say colon s. Colon s will do a substitution. And what you have to give it for a substitution is first you need to give it a regular expression so it decides what it's going to match. And then you need to give it some new text that it's going to match to. So this is actually a use for all that regular expression stuff you've been studying, other than completing assignment one. So in this sentence, we have the use instead of the a bunch of times. And I want to make all those changes. So if I just say s slash the slash the, What's going to happen is my first instance of the has been changed to the. However, we have two more here that were not changed. And so if I say colon again, I can repeat this command two more times. And now we've fixed the full sentence. 
but that's not ideal because we've run this command three times. So I've just undone everything here with three undos. Or I could have used capital U to undo all the changes to that line. Instead, what I want to do is add this dash G or this slash G at the end, which means global. And so if I say this, S the the G, that means make the substitution but make it globally. Don't just stop at the first occurrence you find, but instead change all of them. And if I do that, indeed, we will see everything is being changed. Now, there are a bunch of weird syntaxes you can use with this with. And you'll probably want to do those on a case-by-case -case basis, learn what these mean. The super important one here is uh, percent, because in this case, in command mode, here's an example of things meaning different things. In command mode, percent means the whole file for every command. So, well, depending on where you put it, it can also mean the file name, which is useful in some occasions. Um, but here, if I do percent, uh, s, that's going to mean a substitution in the whole file. So if I say percent %s vim emacs uh, g, what that would do is it would change every occurrence of vim to emacs in the whole file. And I can see that's done 18 substitutions. Um, we're not going to create an emacs rc startup script. Instead, I'm going to undo that. And now we've changed everything back. So. Let's jump down a while. Actually, I can search for search. That gets us relatively close. And then another thing you can do is you can, uh, you can jump between two line numbers, for example, or you can go between two line numbers, for example, if you only want your substitution to be done in a limited region. This is useful maybe if you write a function for one type, and then you want it to be a function for another type. You can copy it, you can paste it, and you can do uh, some changes within. Uh, you should never do this in C++ because C++ has a nice trick to work with this, but other languages like uh, Go, they don't. And so if you're writing Go, this might be something you do a lot. Right, so they just have a summary here. Um, we have slash to search, commands that just involve a bunch of Gs in some capital or uncapital form. Uh, are jumping around your file to different lines. Percent will match parentheses. And finally, we have this colon s command, and that's going to do substitutions. And that last one is really useful. Uh, that's something I use a lot. All right. Now we're getting into some interesting and powerful commands that, that Vim can do. So Another one of these command mode commands is colon exclamation mark. And what colon exclamation mark does is it indicates an external call to the shell. So colon exclamation mark, it's equivalent to us saving and quitting, running a command in bash, and then reopening the file. So this is a neat thing we can do. We can say colon exclamation mark, and then, well, what command do I want to run? Let's say ls. And so at ls's output, it's output test here, because test, you'll recall, is the name of the file I made a little bit earlier here. So that's why we get that. Easy enough. Now, what do they want us to do here? Oh, I see. So, so this command they're indicating to us, it's just effectively how you can write things to be named different things. So remember I said earlier, um, you can run vim with no argument given to it, with no file name given to it. But you can't save. You can't just do colon w because it doesn't have a file name to save to. But you can say colon w my file, like that. And so now you'll see it's written it as my file. And indeed, if, if we go ahead and we ls now, we're going to see we have this new file, my file, which is now vimtutor. And so I will, oh, I shouldn't do that, because that's going to be using my vimrc. I'll tell you more about that later. All right.
So now we're going to encounter yet another mode. So far we have used three modes. We have used insert mode to write text. We have used normal mode to move around, to do deletions, to do these cool operator motion patterns. And finally, we have um, command mode where we've been doing searches and replaces, executing these shell commands, doing these writes, uh, these opening files, and quitting. All that sort of stuff. Now here's one more mode, and it's called visual mode, and the reason for that, somewhat obvious, it's because when you enter visual mode you get this big, gigantic, hard to miss visual indicator of what you're selecting. All you need to do to get into it is to press lowercase v, and now as you move over stuff, it's going to be highlighted. That's in your visual selection. Now, if I say colon, you can see I have these, this weird little thingy here, these comma or apostrophe less than colon apostrophe greater than. What that indicates to me is that I'm in visual mode and that this is going to be a command that works using my visual selection. So I can run any command here and the command I'm going to run is w my file to, like that. And it's going to tell me my file to has been written OK, so if I run ls using this uh, shell syntax, colon, exclamation mark, ls, we're going to see I now have three files here. I have my file, I have my file 2, and I have test. Moreover, if I want, I can check the contents of my file 2. And I'm also going to do that with this uh, shell syntax just by running cat my file 2 from this command. And if I do that, I'm going to see only the stuff from the file that I had selected with the visual mode. So what this visual select mode does, it allows you to just select a small sub subset of the file and from that you can play around with it. You can save it to its own file if you want. You can use all the other commands we had on it if you want. X to remove it. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, and here they say, for example, v deletes the uh, d deletes the text. And so if I hit D, bang, it's gone. Now if I just press V, we're going to be in visual mode like this. It's going to sort of wrap from where our cursor initially was to where we move our cursor now. That's not the only behavior we can have out of Vim. If instead I say Shift V, so a capital V, we're going to get the so-called visual line mode. And what this mode is going to do is it's like visual mode, except it always selects a line, a whole line. So this can be useful if I don't want to bother moving my cursor to the start of a line, then going down, then moving it to the end of the line. I can just select the whole darn line right from the get-go with this Shift V. And just like before, D will delete it if I feel the need to remove this lesson. All right. Well, this is actually well planned out. So the next thing we're going to be looking at is retrieving files, and that's going to be this colon R command. So I've deleted lesson 5.3 because I was so excited that I've just learned this visual delete thing, I wanted to use it. Now, if I regret having deleted lesson 5.3, maybe I want to get it back. Well, I already saved it somewhere. I saved it in my file too. And so I'm going to say retrieve my file too. And if I do that, you can see it's inserted the text in my file too under where my cursor was. And in that way, I've gotten, well, most of the lesson back. I didn't save everything. But everything I saved in my file too, I did get back here. But wait, there's more. I can combine this with this shell syntax that I had earlier. And now we can get into some really cool effects. So. Say, for example, you wanted to add the current date to the file. If you were writing a text document or something and you wanted to add what day it currently was, I could say, you can see the command I'm writing on the bottom, uh, retrieve. And now, instead of giving a file name, I'm giving exclamation mark, which indicates a shell command. And the shell command I want to run is date. And that's what I get. What's going on here is that it's running this commands that I've given it. It's running date. And 
this colon r, this retrieve, says take the output of that, stick it in the file where we are now. So this is very powerful. And for example, I could say r bang ls. And now what I get is a listing of all files in my current directory. I could say r bang who. And now I get a big list of everyone currently logged in on this computer, which might be useful to you if you're doing assignment one. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All right. So just a brief summary of what we've been through. These are commands that are executed in command mode, which is you get into it by going to normal mode and pressing colon. That pulls your cursor down to the bottom of the screen. And this uh, exclamation mark, that allows you to execute a shell command. This R command, it allows you to pull in content from other files into our current file, which is kind of neat. All right. So this O command, I never knew it was called open until I prepared this tutorial a while ago. Um, but what it does is I guess it opens a line. And effectively what that means is it moves your cursor down a line and it puts you into insert mode. So I am on this perfectly good line of text here and I think I'd like to add my own line of text below it. So I'll press O. I'm now below it. I'm in insert mode. I can type. And this is sort of that same pattern I was mentioning earlier. If I decide now I'd like to insert some text above it, well, lowercase o inserts below. And so capital O inserts above. And indeed it does. I can go in here and I can type some more text. So that's this O command. So this is another one that you'll find yourself using a lot. Um, it's just a great thing to have. I mean, this is the primary way that you'll be making new lines of text is with this lowercase o and this capital O because you think to yourself, how else can I make a line of text? Well, I can go into insert mode and hit new line. That's not really what I want. That has whatever was after my cursor there. Nope, it's not liking that. The other thing I could do, I could try using that other command I had to go into insert mode, which was capital A, you might recall, takes me to the end of the line. And now I can hit enter. And indeed, that'll put me on a new line of text. But again, capital A, enter, that's two keystrokes. This command, oh, it does it in one keystroke. Therefore, it's better. All right. Now, I'm not sure why they decided to put it here, but we got another command. This is lowercase a. It is the little brother of uppercase a, which takes you to the end of the line to insert text. Lowercase a functions almost exactly like lowercase i does. It brings you into insert mode, except instead of bringing you to into insert mode at your cursor, it brings you into insert mode one character after your cursor. And the reason that would be useful is because if you're on a piece of text, then this append will bring you after that piece of text. So I'll show you again what I did here. I am currently highlighting lowercase i. Now I press a and e. That does this. If I was on this lowercase i and I pressed i and e, I get this. It's one too early. And so it's not what we want it to do. So if I was here, of course, I could press L to move to the side and then I and E. But again, I'm saving one keystroke. Always save one keystroke if you can. That, that should be the motto of Vim. And so you can go through here. You can continue using this. Oh, I just typed incorrectly that time. So I'll say E to go to the end of the word, A and G. That does what I want it to. All right. We got one more mode for free. This isn't really, 
I'm not sure if this deserves to be called a mode. It's basically just insert mode, um, but with a little bit of difference. And this might be truly confusing to people used to working on conventional text editors because you have this insert button, and when you press the insert button, it makes you replace text. Here we have insert mode and replace mode, and replace mode is where you replace text. Insert mode is where you insert text. And of course, insert really means, on this one on your keyboard, it really means switch between replace and insert mode. Um, but we don't make that distinction in Vim. They're just totally different modes. And the way you get into it is with capital R. So if I move my cursor here, capital R, you can see now at the bottom of my screen, instead of insert mode, I'm in replace mode. And now every character I press is going to replace whichever one is under it. So for four, five, six, capital R to replace mode, five, seven, nine, like so. This is marginally useful. I honestly don't use it much. Maybe that's just me as a typist. All right. Now, copy and pasting text. You already know how to delete and paste text. It's DD to delete a line, then P to paste that text back. Copying is exactly the same, except now instead of using D, which means delete, we use, well, we can't use C, because C already means change. So what on earth will we use for copy? Well, we'll use Y, and we'll call it yank. That's just the design choice they made. So here we go. We can say Y dollar sign, that yanks to the end of the line, and now P pastes it back. And now I go to this word here. I want to change it. I can say CE second, just like before. And yes, they've mentioned down here, yank is an operator. Yank works exactly like you'd expect it to with all of the motions we've seen so far. And that's what makes Vim so fantastic, is that you don't need to relearn all this syntax to work with yank. Yank behaves just like delete and change, except for the fact that it doesn't delete things. I'm not, how, I'm not convinced that this lesson is particularly useful or at least the examples they've chosen. Vim can be configured. Vim has quite a lot of configuration that can be done to it. As I mentioned earlier, its configuration language is Turing complete. Now, you probably won't be building a Turing machine in Vim anytime soon, but you might find yourself using some of the simpler options. And these simpler options are usually in the form of flags. And the way you do this is you can say colon, set, and then the name of the flag you want to set. So the ones they've given here is HL search and ink search. And these are two things that just make search a little nicer. So I'll show you what they do. I'm going to set HL search to turn that on. Now watch what happens when I search for options. The search result is highlighted. And in fact, every search result in the file is highlighted. If that's something that appeals to you, by all means, turn on HL search. One that most people might find themselves using more often or uh, that most people might like is this one, set numbers. Oops, set number. I've just typed it wrong. Right. This turns on line numbers. Now, this is nice. This is fine. One thing about Vim, though, is that you know, we like to repeat commands, and we have motions that go words and stuff. And by the way, you have motions to go up and down lines, J and K. You can use those in your operators, too. So it might be useful. It might be nice. If instead of seeing every single line number, if I could see a line and tell how many lines is it away from my current position. And there's also an option for that. This one is nice. I use this one all the time. So you want set relative number. And if you have set number and set relative number on at the same time, you'll notice that right beside this, I get the, the line number of the current line. 
and then everything else above and below it is how many lines away from this current line it is. So if I wanted to delete until here, until 4, that would say, well, that's two lines away, so I want to delete three lines. So 3dd. And that would do what I wanted to. And that's the end of lesson six. And that's the end of this that I, this Vim Tutor program that I care about. Again, there is a seventh lesson. Um, I recommend you go through it if you have time. It talks about configuration files. Um, it talks about more technical stuff about using Vim. There are more useful commands. I will give you a couple of my favorite commands that, for some reason, Vim Tutor doesn't include, and I don't know why. There are motions. Well, the first two of them are motions, at least. And this first motion is, well, the first two of them, they're very similar to each other, lowercase t and lowercase f. And whenever you're expanding Vim things to sentences, your sort of mnemonic should be that t is 2 and f is find. And the way they work is you just say t, and then you put a single character. And it's going to find the next occurrence of that character on this line. And it's going to go to it. So I could say t p. So you notice there's a p here, and it's taken me one before that p. So again, t p pulls me over here. And I could try the same thing with fp. I, if I say fp, it's also bringing that me to that p. The only difference is that t brings you one before the match, and f brings you to the match itself. So in that way, they're different. Um, it's like the difference between lowercase i and lowercase a. And of course, these are motions. They combine with everything else. And so the way I most frequently find myself using these commands is I say, OK, well, I want to change up to maybe this vim part here. Um, I don't particularly care to count how many words that is. So I don't really want to go say 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, change 10 words. Uh, instead, I can just say change to v. So that's CTV with a capital V at the end for vim. And now I'm in insert mode here, and I can type whatever I want instead. So that's a super nifty command. Now, one other command that I think most people discover accidentally, um, but I will tell it to you explicitly, is capital J. And the way you discover this is by accidentally hitting caps lock, and now everything's not working the way you expect it to, because it's capitals, and the capital letters mean different things. And so you're just trying to move around, and so you hit JJJJJ to move. And in some roundabout way, capital J does move you down a line by bringing the line to you. Let me show you what I mean. I will stat, sit at the bottom of this line, and I will hit capital J. It's bringing lines up. You see, every time I do this, I'm losing a line in my text file as it's pulling it upwards to this current line. And so J is used to merge lines together. This capital J is to merge lines together. So that's one other command I'll leave you with. And there are tons and tons and tons of commands that Vim has. And what I really recommend you do is that you go online, you find a good Vim cheat sheet, because there are dozens of them, and I'm sure they're all reasonably good. And you can print that out, stick it by your computer, and every time you do something, see, is there a cool Vim command that would make me do this even a little bit faster. And if you do that for a couple months, um, you'll be really good at Vim by the end of it. Now, I'll show you one of the cool features of Vim to sort of finish this. And what I'll do is I'll just open this test file, OK? Now, if I was writing C++, as you presumably will be later in the term, and uh, sometimes in C++, I have a header file and I have a source file. And I want to edit them at the same time. Or at least I want to see one while I'm doing the other. There's a command for this. It's called vSplit. So what vSplit's going to do is it takes the name of a file after it that you want to split to, like so. I'll say my file too because it's shorter. Now, well, it doesn't look very good because one, I'm not using my real vimrc, and two, this file is too long and all the lines are wrapping. <coughs> but 
what we have here is we have two files open at the same time. Cool. We can move between them by saying control lowercase w and then using our usual motion keys, so L. Oops. And now I'm editing this other file. And if I do control w h, now I'm editing this first window again. And so in this way, I can either have one file open while looking at another file, or I can have two files open and I can be working on both of them at the same time, which is a super cool feature. And I can, if I want to close the file, I can just do it like normal, wq, write and quit. I'll get my old window back. There's also just a normal split, my file. That splits horizontally. I don't like this as much because it's hard to see. You could split again if you want. Say V split, like that. Uh, and now it's just an unreadable mess. mess. We could split again, as someone in the audience is telling me to do. And we could split again. I'm not saying this is reasonable, and we really can't tell much of what's going on at all in this last file. But we can move around them by saying Control W and then using HJKL keys as we hope they might work. And in this way, we can get unreasonable numbers of VIMs on our screen. Maybe if you have one of those gaming, like 27-inch ultra-wide monitors, you can, you can get a ton of VIMs going on your screen at the same time. And maybe you'll find that useful. I don't. Uh, but I do find that having two VIMs open on occasion is a nice thing to be able to do. Well, I think that's all about all I wanted to say about VIM, and I hope you've taken something away from this. If nothing else, the fact that VIM is an incredibly powerful text editor, and that if you use it correctly, you will be able to do a lot of things very quickly. And do try to use VIM correctly, because, I mean, if you're not using VIM correctly, there's no point to be using VIM. Uh, don't use the arrow keys. I guess that's my takeaway message. Don't use the arrow keys, please. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. How many characters, how many characters is V split and the file name? So the question was how many characters is V split file name? And the answer is too many. But good news for you is that if you complete Lesson seven, there is a trick for completing commands as you write them. And so you don't need to type v split file name. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>